Okay, welcome guys to the Spine Conference. And today's conference was born from a comment by Aaron who said, um, can you help me learn uh, how to read MRIs of lumbar spine? I was like, okay, we'll do that for Spine Conference. So just to get started, does anybody know what this is? Cedar Key. Close, Cedar Point. So this is the new amusement uh, park ride at Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio. I'm going there in a week. And they, the company revenue is about a billion dollars and they take like 8%. They have 11 parks. This is their biggest park. They take like, I think 7%, 8% of it into new rides. So this year's ride at Cedar Point, that's like a 100 million for all 11 parks. So a Cedar Point, which is their mother park, they inserted this new ride uh, it's called Gatekeeper. It's the tallest and it's got, it's like a winged roller coaster where your feet are dangling and there's like four people per car sort of going across so you feel like flying. It costs $20 million. And they also renovated the front of the park. This is like an entrance way. That was $5 million. Gatekeeper. Anybody? Nobody's been here but me, right? We're going there next week. We I'm go. A roller coaster person. That's awesome. Are you? This I is love a, roller coasters. This is the biggest roller coaster park in the world. 17. 17 roller coasters. You should go. Yeah. We're going there next. We go every year. It's kind of like a um, halfway. It's it's a midpoint in the whole country, so we all meet there, like a bunch of us. It's kind of. Nice. Okay, so we're going to go go over MRI. David, what's the history of MRIs? Do you remember? What's the first time you ordered an MRI? 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Remember it was called NMR, Nuclear Ma Magnetic Resonance? Right, right. It was always in the base. I remember when it was at, I was at Hopkins Medical School as it first came out. I was in medical school from 88 to 92. And it was in the basement. It was called NMR. It was really scary, you know, because you thought it was like a nuclear. Good morning, Christina. Good morning, you, because of the word nuclear, I, I felt like I was like in a nuclear sub or there'd be like an atom bomb explosion. And then they changed it to MRI, so, and that was a lot better for people. Not as scary. So the MRI works with magnets, magnetic resonance imaging, and also it's cross sections of the body. So um, the whole thing is based on magnets and not radiation, which is good because radiation causes uh, can cause cancer if you get a lot of it. But I don't think there's any damage to MRI scans uh, to the body. The big question is, like, if you're in the first trimester, will it affect the fetus? I mean, I'm not sure. Does anybody know? I'm not sure if it does anything. I don't think it does. So the Earth has a magnetic field, too, and it's about 25 to 65 microtesla. So to give you an idea, most MRI scans are like a one and a half to three. Like, and the bigger the Tesla, the better the MRI. Like, it's, I think it's faster and it's got better resolution. Our hospital one, I think, is 1.5. So it's cross sections. So if you see something in cross section, it's really it, you, you get an understanding of what's going on inside. So here's a cross section of a house. You can understand like here's a punching bag in the basement where the dad works out probably and you sleep on the top. And the cross section of a complex instrument like a watch. And same thing with the hand is you get a cross section. Um, of a complex instrument, you learn a lot about it. So what when you say magnet, like how's it work? It actually tracks hydrogen. And so if you look at all the elements in our body, but from the periodic table, the most common one is oxygen, 65%. We're 18% carbon and we're 10% hydrogen. And everything else is seven. So you may say, well, why don't we track, why don't we look at oxygen? So we can't because it has to be an odd number of protons, or uh, yeah, protons. So oxygen's eight, which is even. Carbon's six, which is even, and hydrogen's one. So the most common one that's um, an odd number, and don't ask me why it has to be odd. It's got to do with the physics of the MRI. Is hydrogen, and where do we find hydrogen? The most common thing is water, right? And the thing is, um, how much water are we? So if we, if we, if we uh, 
took Erin and just melted her down, how much water would we get out of her? If she was, she was like, uh, let's say she was like 100 pounds, how much water would we get, just estimate? It would be like 60 pounds of water. Yes, he, he has a lot of water, right? So we're mostly, we're more water than we're not. So we're mostly made out of wire, water. 40%, 40% of us, it, most of it's in the intracellular fluid. Then there's a lot of water in the interstitial fluid, and then we have water in plasma too. And then what parts of our body have a lot of water? So blood obviously is a lot. Blood is 80% water. The brain is incredibly high, 80, 80 to 85% water. And things like teeth is only 8 to 10% water, that makes sense. So atoms in nature, they're just kind of random. They just they're aligned in all sorts of different ways, the positive and negative part, they're not aligned. And the way the MRI works is that you, you're put into a magnet and then the magnet lines up all of your hydrogen atoms in a row and then you get a pulse <clears throat> uh, from 90 degree angle of another MRI uh, magnet and then when it returns back to where it was, it lets off some energy in the form of um, uh, radio radio frequency so you're stuck into this tube and there's these big magnets everything's lined up in one direction then you get another direction 90 degrees and when the atoms go back to where they were they set they set off uh, a radio waves so you may say well what's radio waves it's, it's just a form of energy so the highest radio uh, form of energy is gamma rays and then x-rays are pretty high as well so that's why cascan it's not a good idea to do a lot of them because it's just a lot of this energy being zapped into your body and it causes the DNA to um, sort of deteriorate and have problems and then those deteriorated DNAs can become cancer and usually it's like 20 years later. So especially kids, you don't want to radiate kids. Or and then you can you can get this information and it can you can uh, it's got characteristic uh, waveforms and then you can make images from it. Okay, so anybody have any questions what MRIs are? Does that kind of explain it? It's going to... No questions at all, Aaron? Nothing? Okay. So let's go with um, an illustrative case. And this is a real case. This is a 19-year-old woman. Don't say her name, but we know who she is, right? 19-year-old woman who um, had a two-year history of low back and sciatica pain and here are x-rays. So, um, Sherry, what do you think of the x-rays? Crazy looking, big curve, scoliosis? Yes, yes, tiny, tiny bit, but that's... No, but just in general, looks pretty no, normal? Pretty normal. Pretty what do you think of like the bone density? Bone density looks fine as well. Looks pretty good. So no scoliosis. On the side view, the alignment's good. And you can see, sort of see the discs Right, you can see how tall they are. <clears throat> but you, yeah. you, so healthy, healthy nineteen-year-old. So looks very saying. healthy, yeah. Looks very healthy, nineteen-year-old. And and what do you see when you the X-rays? How would you describe an X-ray? What do you guys think? They're like shadows, right? So you, you pulse of energy, and it picks up the calcium, and it just gives you a shadow of all the calcium. So let's go over some MRIs. So I always start with the. Uh, <clears throat> with the sagittal images and the reason why is you can see the whole spine in one view and you get an idea of what's going on in general so Megan what do you think of this MRI what is um, this square thing hold on That's vertebral body. it's a vertebral body and this That's the, disc. the disc and the nucleus pulposus in the middle right mm -hmm. so this disc um, this is this back what's back here Spinal, yeah, spinal and canal, and it's white because inside of your spinal canal you have what? That's fluid. Yeah, so this is cerebral spinal fluid. So the cerebral spinal fluid lights up, which tells you it's a T2 image, and there's fluid inside of the disc too. So that's totally normal. And the back here, the disc has an annulus fibrosis. So, uh, Aaron, what abnormality do you see on this MRI? Mm -hmm. is not the disc is not light so yeah so l5s1 has decreased the uh, signal uh not as light as all the other ones right <coughs> which means what do you think uh, 
so it's lost some of the fluid mm -hmm. its height and you can see it protruding yeah and it's also protruding backwards so what do you think why, why is it is it is that normal like look at the, all the other ones Not no right yeah disc herniation yeah so it's going backwards maybe a disc herniation is it nucleus pulposus that's herniated it could be you know you can't really you can't right, really now tell you see it, now you don't uh, wouldn't that make you suspicious yeah, it very well could be a piece of the nucleus pulposus is going backwards into the spinal canal. Um, that some of the nucleus pulposus is super soft, like almost like water-like, and, and in her, a lot of it was water-like, you remember? But some of it's kind of harder, more on the outside, it's fibrotic, so it's more aimless fibrosis. So, um, it, it's it's the the disc is a heterogeneous, has a heterogeneous character about it. It's not all just one. I'll show you what I... Um, I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So what? So this, I know this is, is in the midline because see this thing? That's the posterior spinous process. So when you see this, you know in the midline. Can you see the posterior spinous process here? No, right? So it's so you're off the midline. So it's like a parasagittal cut. So how about here? Can you see the posterior spinous process here? So no, so it's like a parasagittal cut. So can you... Um, who can guess what this longitudinal structure is that goes up and down the body and is dark in front aorta. of the spine? Aorta. Yeah, it's the aorta and the uh, IVC. And then it looks like it's bifurcating here, right? So what do you guys think that is at L405? Iliac. Yeah, the iliac veins, the bifurcation of the iliac veins. So that's why L4, L5 particularly is a very difficult level to get to in the spine because it's at the bifurcation of the iliac veins and also the ascending, ascending lumbar vein goes into the bifurcation there and that can easily tear. Um, it's just something you know from surgery. because it, it, So L4, L5 is particularly difficult. So here's another parasagittal cut. <clears throat> and um, Aaron, what's this hole here? This big uh, thing right yeah. here on the side below uh, the pedicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this little thing in here inside is the nerve root. And the nerve root lives in the, we call it what? For Latin, for whole. Foramen. Foramen, yeah. So this is the foramen, whoa, foramen of the uh, vertebral body. And, and within the foramen lies the nerve root. So you can see how a, a disc herniation here can go backwards into the foramen and also hit the nerve root. But there's also something else that I found that can hit the nerve root in the frame and is what's this thing here too? With the two, where the two bones come the together. Facet. It's the facet, right. So the facet can become hypertrophic, right, with arthritis. So if you have a hypertrophic capsular tissue in the facet, it can actually push into the nerve root, uh, into the foramen. So that's another cause for foraminal stenosis is, uh, is the facet itself. Um, and what's uh, this thing? This line. Just give a guess. It's along the vertebral body. So it's a vessel. It's an intersegmental vessel. So we have these vessels that exit the spine and bring venous flow into the IVC. And we also have an arterial vessel that pumps it into the spinal cord and spinal canal. See it here? So it comes off the aorta, it goes into the spinal canal, it also drains the spinal canal. Uh, and they're always in the middle of the vertebral body. So we just know this from anterior spinal surgeries that they bleed and we have to be just careful of them. They can bleed a lot sometimes too, so you have to ligate them. Um, okay, so these are what views? What kind of views? Yeah, so these are axial cuts, and it's at what level? Look down here. Right? Uh, L5S1. L5S1. And what are these things? Just a butterfly? Looks like a butterfly a little bit, doesn't it? That's bone. So, huh? You're saying it's bone, right? Yeah, that's a bone. It kind of looks like a butterfly. So it's a sacral ala, right? So ala is a Latin term for wing. So. So the ala, this is a sacral ala, and it looks like a wing when you cut it. And also when you look at it, it looks like wings in the anatomy. So this is at L5S1. And what's this thing right here? Spinal canal. Spinal canal, right. So if you look carefully here at the axial cuts, 
it's cutting through just below the disc space. So you're looking at the sacral ala, the sacrum, just below the disc space. So it looks kind of normal, right? So just so you remember, ala it looks like a wing. So the sacrum kind of looks like a wing. And the other thing is like when we do fusions, L5S1 fusions, which is a common thing, we decorticate this, and we expect this to heal to the transverse process of L5. It's like a big bony area. And this is so the sacrum. This is S1. This is the S1 nerve root. This thing out here is a nerve root too. And this is the L5 nerve root. So you don't know this. Most people don't know that the L5 nerve root lives here, but as spine surgeons, we know that because sometimes we put screws into the sacral ala here. I don't do it as often as I used to, but I used to do that. And you can hit the L5 nerve root there. So just a reminder, this is where it comes from. This, this is the sacral ala, and it kind of looks like wings. And here's the spinal canal. So now we're going upwards the spinal canal at the L5-S1 uh, disc. So who wants to comment what it looks like? Here's the spinal canal. What do you guys see? Somebody. It's not as open as it was. Yeah, so here's oh, here, here's the spinal canal. It's a nice circle. And now this, remember we knew it from before. Remember you said the L5-S1 disc is bulging backwards? It's bulging backwards. And would you say, is it, is it left or is it right? So you know, what is this thing right here? Spinous posterior spinous process, right? So we know the posterior spinous process is in the midline. So you kind of can understand here's, here's the left, here's the right. That's the middle. So this disc herniation, is it left or is it right or is it middle? Slightly left, but... Maybe a little bit left, yeah. It does look a little bit left, but a lot middle too, right? Okay, and this thing is, this structure here is what? The two bones come together. Here's one bone, here's another bone. Facet. This is a facet, right. So this also, this is the hole where the nerve comes out, which is also called the foramen. So can you guys see if you have a hypertrophic facet capsule, it can go into the uh, foramen and compress the nerve root? So you can see that if you if you, um, you can think about it. So now, hold on, we're going up another level now, another two millimeters. So was Sherry right when he said it looked more left? This is the left, this is the right. It does, doesn't it? Doesn't it look a little bit more left? And here's the nerve root on the right. You can see the dorsal and the ventral nerve rootlets there of the nerve root. and can't see it so well here on the left because it's what being compressed by this disc herniation and this patient what side did she have pain Aaron remember left. It was left yeah so she had left sciatica pain so she had pressure on her left s1 nerve root and it was in the s1 nerve root runs down the back of the leg posterior buttock posterior thigh lateral portion of the foot it was giving her a lot of sciatica pain in s1 dermatome distribution the other thing is that the disc herniation was also being compressed on the backside by a little bit of what? What is this stuff here that connects the two lamina of the vertebral bodies posteriorly? The it's a yellow, right? The ligament, right? The ligamentum flavum, which is yellow. So her disc, so the other thing these people get is it's bulging, the disc is bulging backwards and the height's lost a little bit, right? And then this can cause the ligamentum flavum to buckle and also give some posterior pressure. But also ligament inflammation also can, can become hypertrophic for some reason. So it also it also grows and, and compresses. And you can see how if you have a hypertrophic ligament inflammation posteriorly, it can sandwich the nerve root. See how the nerve root's a little bit sandwiched? It's compressed by both sides. So if there was nothing here, it wouldn't be as bad. So that's why some people, in some cases, you can just decompress posteriorly. So you can you can imagine if you just could magically remove this. Well, would you, if you remove it with surgery. The nerve has more room now. Even though it's compressed in the front, it's got more room to drape backwards in the back and the pain goes away. So some people, you know, you can do this in spine surgery and it works sometimes. You just posteriorly decompress and even though the disc herniation is still there, the nerve has more room and it's okay. So the, the times that we do this is when it's calcified. So sometimes when the disc is super calcified, it's, it's a rock and it's really hard to get out. By removing it, you do take some risks of injuring the nerve, which is really bad when it happens. There's no comeback to that. So you never want that to happen. So you can make a case like, well, for, in this patient, I'm just gonna decompress posteriorly uh, and um, not remove the disc, which is calcified, and the patient should be fine. In this case, though, it was a young woman, and it was not calcified. It was really soft, and it was easy to remove. So we removed it in this case. So now we're going up, and what's this thing here? What's this circle here, you can say? 
looks like a piece of spaghetti on end. It's a nerve root. Yeah, it's a nerve root. CL5 nerve root. Because this is the five root of a body. This is the nerve root, and it's in what thing? It's a hole. The hole where the nerve goes out. Frame. The foramen, yeah. So this is the L5 nerve root exiting the foramen in the mid portion of the foramen. And it's, it's kind of big um, because it's probably the dorsal root ganglion which is the brain center of the nerve, so to speak. It's where, it's where the nerve connects to other nerves. And it's, uh, so it's a little bit swollen there. So how would you describe the central portion of the spinal canal here? Looks good? Looks pretty wide open, doesn't it? What are those little dots? The actual nerves. Yeah, the actual nerves, right? And there's plenty of white all around the nerves, and white is what? Fluid. Cerebral fluid. spinal fluid, yeah. So this is, you see, this is just inferior to the pedicles. So the nerves live in the thecal sac. Here are the nerve rootlets, and what is when all these nerves look together, it looks like a horse tail. What, what, are we, what Latin term do we give it? Cardioquina, right. And you can see here at every level, so this is, this nerve is, this is, um, what is nerves this? This is two, this is three. Okay, so these looks like the sacral, these are lumbar nerves, I think. But yeah, the, so the L5S1 there on the right. Oh, this is L5-S1. Okay, so these are sacral nerves. <coughs> but the way it works is um, at every level, a nerve exits. So in the quad or quina, like at L1, all the nerves are there present. So if you have a high disc herniation, say at T12-L1, all the nerves of the lumbar spine could be compressed. So they're all sitting there waiting to exit, sort of. Okay, this is uh, at the level of the pedicle of L5. And what's this white thing that's the same color of fluid into the vertebral body? What, what would be, is this CSF going into the vertebral body? No, right? CSF doesn't go into the vertebral body, but what is if what fluid is in the vertebral body? You do like a corpectomy, it bleeds like crazy. It's a vessel, right? So it's like a feeding vessel into the vertebral body. So the vertebral body has to have a blood supply. It's got a rich blood supply. And this is a, you can see there's like a feeding vessel. It's on the side there, and it goes into the body. And that's how cancer and infection gets into the vertebral body. So the disc does not have a blood supply, but the vertebral body is richly uh, um, supplied with the blood vessels. And that's how cancer and that's how infections get into the vertebral body. They start in the vertebral body. Infections start in the the cancer never goes into the disc space itself. It's impossible because it's avascular. But infections do get into the disc space. But they start in the vertebral body where there's a blood supply, and then it can erode into the disc space, and then the infection goes crazy once it hits the disc space. And why is that? Why does it grow nuts in the disc space? Much faster than in the vertebral body, because it's avascular. There's no and if there's no vascular, who fights infections? Blood cells, right? So if you have no blood there, there's nobody fighting the infection in disc space. So the bacteria can grow uh, unimpeded. You know, there's nobody stopping them in the disc space. Okay, this is, um, so this, I can tell you, this is the vertebral body of L5, see that? And now we're going up another level, now this is the disc of L4, L5, and how can you tell, see the difference in color of the disc at L4, L5 versus the, um, L, uh, the vertebral body? So on the T2 weighted images, you can see the color changes in the disc space, so you can tell you're at the level of the disc space. And again, what's this structure where two bones come together? The facet. the facet, right. And sometimes there's signal or fluid in the facet. And what, what is that from? If you see a lot of fluid in the facet, what does that mean? It could be a, like synovial cyst. could be, so you could have a synovial cyst. The other thing is that you could have spondylolisthesis. So what happens, and it's just fluid in the facet because it's, it's distracted. So what happens is when you lay down in the MRI scanner, the spondylolisthesis reduces, and when it reduces, the facets are gapped. Do you guys under, can can you picture that? So, and when they're gapped, it fills up with fluids. So even though the MRI looks normal in the sagittal cut because they're laying down and there's no spondylolisthesis, on the axial cuts you see a lot of fluid in the facet, which tells you that that facet is going back and forth a lot because there's, there shouldn't be that much fluid in it. So that's a way that you can tell that there's dynamic spondylolisthesis on the axial cut on an MRI. Um, Would you say that's adequate space for a facet joint for a 19 year old at L45 here? Yeah, that's totally normal. That's normal. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's um, there's a black cortical rim because it's the end of the, the bone and then, and then there's cartilage. This is the cartilage layer. 
Okay, so we I said I'd get back to the disc. So the disc, this is a totally normal, healthy disc uh, in a 15-year-old from pathology slide. Probably the child died in a car accident or something. And you see the disc, it doesn't look it doesn't look uh, homogeneous at all. It's 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 very different. So this stuff in here is almost all water, and this stuff in here is very very tough and hard. So it's not it, when you get disc fragments, they're different. Like sometimes a, a piece of this flips out and is really hard, which we see. Usually it's stuff here from the middle part. And when this stuff, what happens when this stuff? Have, did did you, did you watch the last case? The, the soft stuff, how, what does it look like? It, just, it gets, what, sucked up by the sucker, right? Right. So when you have like a little bit of a nucleus pulposus, it just gets sucked up by the uh, uh, sucker. And this nucleus pulposus stuff, the very middle part, which, when, it, what's in, when, in it's, when it's in the spinal canal, it goes away. So what happens is it's like this really soft water-like material, and it, and it gets absorbed very quickly by the body. So that's why you get a lot of uh, young people um, that get sciatica and it goes away. So, so does that make sense to you guys? So when you have a really soft disc that's made up of nucleus pulposus, it gets e easily eaten up by the um, body. So the way it works is the blood vessels grow into the area and um, encompass the soft tissue and then white blood cells leave the leave the uh, veins and engorged into the nucleus pulposus and phagocytosis eat it up and it goes away. So the reason why I know this is we do soft disc herniation surgeries and there's no disc there. It's gone. They're like what happened to it? I mean I know it was there from the MRI scan. I'm sure of it. But where the disc used to be is just a leash of vessels. So that that's that's what happens. So this is um a more deteriorated disc and you see there's no nucleus pulposus here it's kind of gone because the water has gone away and um, it's bulging backwards into the spinal canal. Is this different than desiccation? Same thing. Or so the same, just de same desiccation thing. Desiccation is the name of this yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's the desiccation of the disc. So here's a totally normally well hydrated disc and here's a disc that's desiccated less water content and as it further deteriorates there's like a space left and you can get like a vacuum sign phenomenon on x-ray and sometimes in these very de deteriorated cases like you've, you've seen them so you probably haven't noticed it but in the difficult in the uh, deteriorated cervical cases when we when we cut into the disc when we cut into a soft person's remember we cut into a young person's disc it's just and when they have disc herniations it's it's the whole disc is still there and it's soft and we just take it all out and there's a lot of disc material and then in these older like the person we did yesterday 78 year old there's nothing in there right we drill in and it's like a hole and the disc is gone and it's, there's a vacuum space and that's why you can get vacuum spaces on x-rays and it kind of looks like this. So, so here's, um, here's a cut at what level? Five, four, three, four. Three, three, four, right? And here's centrally, what do you think? Nice big area, right? And why are the nerve roots, see all the little nerve roots here, the little dots? Why are they hanging out in the back of the canal. It's like in the classroom at school. All the kids are in the back. They don't want to be in the front. Why is that? Because the disc is the teacher? Why are they all hanging out the back? It's near the foramen. No, no. Think again. They're laying, the MRI. they're laying down. Yeah. So because they're laying down on their back on the MRI, they don't make you lay on your stomach because it's uncomfortable. They lay on your back. The nerve roots straight backwards. So just, just so you know, that's why they're there. So you can imagine when people walk, where are they? In the middle, centrally. Probably in the middle. And what else? When you walk, what do you do? Your, your legs are moving, and the nerves are inside your legs, right? They're moving. Yeah. And your leg, when it goes back and forth, the nerve is moving while your leg is moving. So these things are moving around in the spinal canal. So if you could somehow make an MRI movie, mm -hmm. if you think about it, those things are moving around. So that's why a small disc herniation may not be hitting the nerve roots on the MRI scan, but when they're walking, it may be hitting them because that's not where they are when the patient's walking. Right. So that's why some patients say, you know, it only hurts when I walk. Well, that makes sense. And if you think about it, because it's not, it's not sitting there, people, that's not what people look like when they walk, the MRI scan. The MRI scan is just the best possible picture that we can do while the patient's still in supine. So that's, these are these things that's gotta be going through your mind, you know, when you, when you evaluate MRI scans. 
So what do you think of this level? What's this um, big circular thing in the abdomen? The aorta. And this thing right here on the side kind of looks like a bean. It's a kidney right there. So we're at level five, four, three, two, one, at L1. And what do you think of the spinal canal here? Good size, right? Big one. Okay, so the other thing you have to remember is people are different. So when you're looking at the MRI scan, is it Manute Bowles MRI scan? Or is it Spud Webb's MRI scan? And they probably look different, right? Like this guy's body on the MRI scan will look a lot different than this guy's body on the MRI scan. So these are all things you have to consider too in your mind. Like what's the body habitus of the person? So this is a spot this is a spinal canal. This is a side view and a front view. And just these are just generalities, but they're very important to understand is that usually on the side view, the shape is the same all the way up and down. It shouldn't be like really tight in the bottom. It shouldn't be tight in the middle. It should be pretty much the same. And in the, in, the cer in the cervical spine, there's a bulge at C4, C5, C5, C6, C6, C7. The spinal cord and spinal, spinal cord is a little bit bigger there. And the reason is that's, the, that's where we use all our arms, our uh, motor strength, C, C4, C5, C, C5, C, nerve root, C5, C6, C7 are the workhorses of our arms. And that's why the spinal cord is a bit swollen there. But it should be the same all the way up and down. And this is like a... This is a average at L1, this is an average at L3, and this is an average at L5. It should be very similar in shape. And this is just important because, it's, and it's, 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 for me, it's really irritating because radiologists sometimes say severe stenosis, mild stenosis, no stenosis, when the, the canal is obviously stenotic to me. And the reason is they, they see like millions of MRI scans, so they may, through the radiologist's minds, like, I see this all the time. That's not abnormal. But it is abnormal to this patient because the patient's having symptoms, but the radiologist doesn't know that. They're just looking at a million films. So it's a thing, a thing for me is like, how can you quantitate something in different people to understand it best? Well, you can measure it. So you can, if millimeter is not, if you say something in millimeters, that is not subjective, that's objective. So many people, in, when they describe the spinal canal, they put it in millimeters, which I think is really good. And that's the best way to be objective about it. But then you also have to understand that this person's millimeters is gonna be a lot different than this person's millimeters. So what I do is I just, I just compare it to different levels. And, I, and I'll tell you what I mean like that. So L1 in the same patient, L3 should be very similar to L1 and L5 should be very similar to L3. So that's the way that I sort of use a control in each patient. So just, in general, the lumbar spine should have um, a um, AP diameter of between 15 and 17. And in the cervical spine, it should be like around f uh, third, uh, 14. So if it's, l if, it's, if it's less than 10 in the cervical spine, people say it's like absolute stenosis. But these are all ballpark measures. Okay, so, so a lot of radiologists like measure the AP distance from here to here. And then other people also do the diameter, I mean the circumference. What I usually do is I just measure from here to here the AP, AP um, area and also I measure the, the medial lateral area and it just gives me a, a ballpark generalized number. So L1, I measure it could be like 15 by 15 and I measure L3 it could be 10 by 10. Well that's significant. I mean it should be 15 by 15 the whole way down pretty much if L1 is 15 by 15. So that tells me that the, the spinal canal is developmentally small there. Does that make sense? So that, that's, these are just small ways for me to understand the spinal canal because as a surgeon, if I do something that's the wrong operation, patient doesn't do better, they're gonna blame me, nobody else. And I have to understand like what's normal to try to help these people. Okay. So, so any questions about things? Okay, so let's keep going. Um, Megan, what are these um, strands here? Bessels. Yeah, so these are vessels, right? And they go into the spinal canal. And the same patient, this is, um, this is like a fat suppression um, uh, MRI scan. We'll get into the good uses of that. And you see the L5 vessel disc herniation there. And you can see how um, 
uh, how the discs should have a good water um, signal, um, T2 weighted signal. Okay. Good question about the vessels. I've seen in vertebroplasties and kyphoplasties sometimes where the cement can trickle into a vessel and you right. see it on fluoro. Right. I've heard two different kinds of schools of thought. Some, some, some surgeons say, oh, it's, it's fine, it's not a big deal. Some surgeons get really worried about that. Right. Is that, I mean, you're, just, are you pretty, pretty much just rolling dice to make sure there's no symptoms with the patient, just hope nothing happens, or is that something that you really worry about? Uh, well, is, is there anything to do about that? Because I don't think there really is, is there? Well, actually, that, uh, it reminds me of a Russian, um, a Russian um, folk saying. It's like there's these two men in a rowboat, and um, they're, they, um, they're, the ship uh, was a fire, so they had to jump into the rowboat to save themselves. So um, the two guys and one guy is rowing, and the, other, the second guy goes, listen, let's just pray to God because that's how we're going to get home. And the guy goes, look, you can keep, you can pray to God, but just keep rowing while you're praying, okay? So, I mean, you can pray, but you also have to work on the, the earth. You know, you got to help yourself. So just praying is not good. So what's the problem? I mean, you have to think about it objectively. Sure. Like, what's the problem? If, if the cement goes into the vein, where does the vein go? It keeps going, right? right. Where does it go? Goes to the heart, right? It leads to the heart. And then it also can go into the lungs. So... What usually happens, um, what happens, Aaron, can you tell everybody? Or no? Uh, you don't have to. Is it the conversation we had? Yeah. It's not necessarily the cement itself, but it's the uh, chemical process created by the cement that causes like a coagulation cascade or... Uh, right. So these people get a functional PE. So, so what happens is um, they, they, um, the venous system clamps down in the lungs from the toxins from the cement because the veins are exposed to cement. The cement has toxins. Mm -hmm. The body reacts to the toxins in a, so, some kind of response. I don't know what it is, but say something like a, like a bee sting allergic response. Everything clamps down. That happens in patients' lung and patients die. So you've heard of, have you guys ever heard of patients dying um, after total hip replacements when they get cement? So it, it happens. So if you have a big bolus of cement, it gets into the venous system, patient's blood pressure drops and people die. So that's the fear. So if you see it going into the veins, well, that means there's, it's in the venous system now sure. and you may create that cascade. So you're taking a risk, sure. I think. I mean, how much risk, I don't know, but it's all probabilities. So when I do the kyphoplasties, once it goes into the venous system, I stop. I was like, that's it, I'm not going. Right. Right. And there's also there's been case reports of the of the cement going right into the veins into the lungs, and uh, floating through the heart and then going lodging it in the lungs. So you can imagine what a big bolus that was, um, and that's a disaster when that happens. And the other thing, what's this? Um, does anybody know what this big artery is that comes off on the left side in the around L1 T12 L1 that goes into the spinal canal? And um, if you ligate it in surgery, like in vascular surgery, patient goes paralyzed. You guys ever? You guys know? The, it's called the ad, ad, artery of Adankiewicz. So there's a the spinal cord uh, at the level of the conus around T12 has a big feeder usually. And um, if you hit this during vascular surgery, what happens is they clamp it off inadvertently. The patient wakes up paralyzed. So you have to be careful that there's big feeders to the spinal cord at that level. But it's usually on the left side, usually T11, T12, L1 that feed the spinal cord. So that's another anatomical landmark that you have to you know, be wary of. And you, you can injure this during kyphoplasty. So if you, if, you, if you cause that artery to become spastic, like let's say you just hit it and it spasms, the blood supply is lost to the spinal cord, patient wakes up paralyzed. So I've seen it happen before. And there's no other ab anatomic abnormality otherwise the patient's the spinal cord is not working. So you can get spasms of the artery of Adankiewicz with spinal procedures too, with epidurals. Okay, so this is um, just, a, I threw this in here, that the, that the um, vertebral body grows through these uh, endosteal end plates here at the pedicle and here at the pedicle. Okay, so any questions? Kind of a lot of material. So this is a... Uh, How unusual is it for a 19-year-old to have a herniated disc? Um, unusual. It's like not common. 
but but that's when the deteriorative process starts. So the deteriorative process starts at around the age of 15. Is when the blood supply gets shut off to the to the around 15 is when the blood supply gets shut off to the discs. Kids have um, kids have vascular discs, and that's why kids get these um, disc-based infections that can be treated with antibiotics. So a discitis in a child is totally different from a discitis in an adult. At around 15, the the blood supply goes away to the disc as part of the natural developmental process. And that's when the, I think the disc starts to deteriorate. So you see kids sometimes with the 18, 19 year olds with disc carnations. And you see that one girl, she has no blood, she saw there's no water there. She's got a deteriorated L5S1 disc. So that's when it starts. Is there anything that you think led to it, particularly in that patient? Or just was bad luck? <laughs> uh, in this patient, she had no injury. So as human beings, we always like to have a story for everything. Like, we, like when something doesn't make sense, we create a myth or we say that there's gods of Mount Olympus that makes lightning. I mean, we, we always like stories to explain the world, but sometimes there is no story to the world. So in her, she's just, uh, she's got, she's just probably, she probably has a, you know, a DNA is written out that she deteriorates at, at the age of 19. So she's got a familial predisposition. The other thing is they've done, they have these um, twin studies, I think it's in Sweden, where they watch a thousand twins and they did an MRI, they do MRI scans on one twin was an accountant, the other twin was a carpenter. So one guy's really using his back constantly, and the other guy never uses his back, just sits. And they did MRI scans of these 45-year-old men, and the MRIs are exactly the same. Exactly the same. I mean, you see the disc carnation, they're totally the same. So that tells you something. It's got nothing to do with the activity level and DNA. And when they try to quantitate it, they say it's like 60% DNA and the 40% life. Okay. Okay, so here's another one. This is a different, this is a much older person, 81 years old, uh, who has a long history of left, greater than right, low extremity pain, low back pain. He had prostate seeds at the age of 44, which is very young, because it's younger than me. High blood pressure, he's a retired carpenter. He's a big dude, six feet, 220, neuro intact. So what do you think here of the x-rays, um, Aaron? Please see these big, what are these oh, white things? Fight. The huge osteophytes, yeah. So he, this guy has diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. So some people, as you get older, it's very common. Some people develop these massive osteophytes throughout the entire spine. And the discs are, how the discs look? Pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. So it's kind of weird to have this huge osteophyte with a totally normal disc. So this is not a disc deterioration. This is a different process that this man has. He's a diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. It's totally, but his discs are good. So what do you guys think of the sagittal cuts here? Remember we said like it's hard to say what's normal in people, so you try to use a you try to use a baseline. So here's here's what I find is the baseline at level five, four, three, two, one. At the T12 L1 spinal canal, I think that's what he should be. So I go down. What do you see? Yes, stenotic at this level, this level, this level, and this level, right? Uh, 102, 203, 304, 405. L5S1 looks pretty good. So here are the axial cuts. Again, so what I do is I just use this as a baseline, T12L1. You see the base of the spinal cord. And I think his lumbar spine should be the same all the way down. So what do you think of here? This is at L1, L2, L2, L3, L3, L4. L4, L5, and L5S1. So what do you think? What do you guess? Somebody else can talk to you. Anybody? What do you guys think of the spinal canal? Just like you said, it compressed. It's very compressed, right? So why? So you can measure it. So you can measure this to this, and then measure this to this. You see, this is like a third, isn't it? Yeah. And then, and then this one's like almost like a fifth of what that one is. <laughs> yeah, and also what what th what is different from this one to this one? What do you not there's, see in this one? There's no fluid. There's no spinal fluid at all, right? Because there's no room for it. So when it gets small, the spin there's no spinal fluid there anymore, and it's wide here. Okay, so here's another case. So that patient was just stenosis. He had a decompression. So here's another case of a 90 year old woman. Here she is. And she was doing fine, no problems whatsoever, and then immediately she couldn't walk, and she said her back is killing her. So what do you think it probably is, just clinically? 
He's having a bad day. I think it's cancer. What are your thoughts? Uh, he's probably compression fracture, right? So that's what happens acutely. So here's your x-rays. Who can find the fracture? Is it this one? Is it this L2. one? Is it this one? Is it L2? Yes. Is it L1? Is it T12? They all should be a square, right? Is that one a square? Yeah. No. Nope. Is that one a square? Mm. No. no, right? Looks no. Little, it's not totally square. This one? So which one of these is fractured? Both of those? It's hard to see. Yeah, probably, I would say probably L2 and maybe both yeah. yeah maybe both so what benefit we have with the electronic medical records is that people get serial x-rays sometimes because they have always have constantly having back pain and we order x-rays and sometimes the radiologist will say well that L2 was present in April which that gives you an idea that's old but sometimes you don't have that benefit so this patient had an MRI scan so look at the color of this bone 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 this bone and this bone and you guys remember from Sesame Street which one is different? Which one is not the same? Which one is different? So which one's different? One. This one, right? L1. But this one is the same. So what does that tell you? That's old, right. And it healed, and it looks exactly like the other ones now. So that's not a fracture. So I've seen many times when people do, do kyphoplasty on these, uh, these deformed bones, but they probably don't hurt because the bones are normal. It's healed. This was where the patient's pain's coming from. Okay, so... And if she, had, if she hadn't come to you, say, you know, when the pain arrives, then over time, then that, that material body would also then slowly become the color of the normal one. Yeah, so in three years, in probably two years, that will look totally normal too. But she may suffer for three months, right. which is a problem. But maybe not. I mean, some people are fine. They just take a, like a hydrocodone and they're good. They're like, I'm all right, I don't need surgery. I was like, all right, that's fine. So here's, a, here's what we do in MRI. This is the x-ray machine during the kyphoplasty. And so this is what the bone looked like. It was really on the front view, it was really crooked. And then I wanted to see which one was left or right, so I put my iPhone on the x-ray machine just to see which side is left or right, just to prove it. That's what an iPhone looks like on an x-ray. So you put a, you put, first you put like a really big, thick, like it looks like a poker sort of into the bone and you're watching it on x-ray make sure it's in the right place and then there's a tube there you take out the middle and then there's a tube and then through the tube you stick a wire at the end of the wire is a balloon and you open the balloon into the bone to create a cavity there I'm opening it up and then I do it on the other side open up the balloon and then there's a tube there and then there's another tube and then I stick cement I'm sticking cement now in the bone this is the kyphoplasty so this is a time lapse. So you saw I stuck cement into it. So this is a side view of the bones. Here I'm sticking it, the balloon, in, opening the balloon, and then another balloon on the other side. And then now I'm slowly filling it up with cement. See how I'm filling it up with cement? And if you fill it up with cement, it gives people, um, sometimes it gives people immediate pain relief, but sometimes not. Okay, so that's kyphoplasty. That's what we did in that patient. All right, we're almost done here. Um, any other questions about MRIs? Okay, just to give you guys a history of uh, radiology, Ronkin was the first person to image this, the body at all with an x-ray machine. That's his wife's hand with, with her wedding ring. He was a German physicist, and he was a, one interesting thing about his life, he was expelled from high school because he he refused to um, reveal a classmate who created a disparaging drawing of a teacher, and he was expelled. It's kind of interesting. Was this, was his friend? <laughs> it was his friend, yeah. They expelled. No, but it was no I don't know what expelled. happened. No, he didn't. He didn't rat on his friend. <laughs> oh right, I guess no one ever. Did. No, he didn't reveal who the classmate was. So the MRIs initially started with someone from downstate New York, Raymond Damian created an MRI type uh, structure to, he, he did it mostly to find cancer, not to image the anatomy, just to find cancer. Um, these are the, the two men in the 40s that worked on nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, the person who got, the people who got the uh, Nobel Prize for MRI was Peter Lauber from University of Illinois and Peter Mansfield from Nottingham. They, they took uh, the Median's um, MRI machine and then 
uh, added to it uh, mathematical um, equa uh, process with, with computers, and they imaged the first uh, mouse. Here's their image of the mouse. So what's um, what's the difference between CAT scan and MRI scan? The CAT scan is faster. It's cheaper. It's only like 200 bucks. Um, an MRI scan is like 800 bucks. Can, can you decrease that? It's so irritating. Can you see it now? Yeah. yeah. So MRI is like 850 bucks. Um, a CAT scan is not claustrophobic because it's a big circle, and MRI is claustrophobic. Usually, a good one anyway. The closed ones. You can see bones better on CT. MRIs are better for soft tissues. Um, you can see fractures really well on um, MRI scans. See how it lights up. You can see things like avascular necrosis. Um, the other thing is that the MRI scan um, uh, commonly can avoid red herring. So, like in that case, the X-ray. Remember that one's a red herring. It wasn't it wasn't a real fracture. It was just a deformity. So it's really good of telling you the correct diagnosis sometimes. And a red herring works like when a dog's trying to find the fox, if you take a red herring, the fish, and put it through the trail, the dog goes after the fish trail. So that's how you can throw somebody off your scent. So here's another case, um, Aaron. So this is a, like an 88-year-old woman with low back pain. What do you think? What's the story? You're pretty good now, sagittal cut. Five? Five, four. It's okay, four. What's, does four look normal? Four does not look normal. Mm -hmm. um, it's a T2 weighted image. What's going on here? I, there's some um, increased signal on the anterior. In the bone, portion. right? Yeah, so there's a lot of, in, so that's like f the form of water. And what about three? Is three okay? And three definitely does not look normal. And the shape is definitely deformed, but how about the color? The color's okay. It's normal, isn't it? Right. And how about these? Normal. Yeah. So what do you think is going on in this patient? At L3, it's an old or new? It's an old, old fracture. Old fracture. L4 is probably a new, new fracture. New fracture. Yeah. So she broke that two years ago, and now she has a new fracture at L4. So she just went for an L4 kyphoplasty, uh, and the other one was just left alone. Um, but actually, unfortunately, in this patient, she came. She still had pain post-op, and and it was running down her leg. So, what do you think? Um, she didn't have that pre-op, interestingly. So, what was stenotic there? Why did she have pain run down the leg? Here's the frame, and here's the nerve root. What do you think was giving her pain? She was getting uh, compression or stenosis in the frame. She had stenosis. Here's the nerve root in the frame, and she had stenosis from the deformity from the fracture too. So we took her old fracture, was it? Both actually. So although she didn't complain of it, post op she still had pain running down her leg. It was kind of like a new pain. So we decompressed her and she did she did great, right? She walked home the next day. And here's the spinal canal. It should be a round circle again. This is at L five S one, nice round circle. And this is at level was this three four. You see it's not a round circle, it's triangular in shape, there's a posterior bulging disc. Okay. So any other questions? I have one more normal. I think we're going to go over normal. All right, Megan, what do you think of uh, this case? Anything abnormal, normal? What do you think? I think it's pretty normal except for that disc space. Um, I guess about four. Yeah, so the L5S1 disc space has what? Decreased. Decreased color. And it's the color is water, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like a, like, uh, Dr. David told us his desiccated L5-S1 disc. And just to tell you, this muscle here, who can guess what this muscle is? It's a uh, filet mignon. So is. So as, yeah. Must be your favorite. Is that your favorite cut of meat? Uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> no bone, no. Tender, <laughs> tenderloins, yeah, multifes. I said uh, filet mignon. Filet mignon. So it's like a little <laughs> circle when you get it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that it, it attaches to the transverse processes of the spine. Here's the transverse process in the parasitoidal cut. Um, and see this, see how wide the spinal canal can be uh, normally. This 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 patient had a wide spinal canal, and here's the spinal canal. It should be t wide. See how wide this is. And this patient, if she gets a disc herniation, she's not going to have much in the way of symptoms because her nerve roots have plenty of room. And you can see it's totally symmetric. She's a totally normal spine. And we usually don't see normal people. They don't come to doctors. They just, they're living their lives playing soccer or whatever, going to movies. 
So we usually see the deformities of the spine. So we think like, you know, this is really what's normal. So it's important to know what's normal when you're in the office. But this patient was having pain? She was having low back pain from L5-S1 degenerative disc disease. Okay. But her spinal canal was normal. Okay. So I just showed you that this is what normal should look like or very well functioning. I mean, what's normal? We're all in this range of, of numbers, like Manute Bowl versus Muggsy Bogues. And we're all, we're a range of sizes. But the people with a normal spinal, with a good spinal canal usually don't have problems. And most people are like that, like 85% of people. Like, not, does, everybody's not lined up outside my office needing surgery. Most people, they, they've never met me, they're never gonna see me as a spine surgeon. So the, most people are like that, they're okay. Okay, that's it. That's a cedar point. So any questions? I think you learned a little bit about it. It's a start. All right. All right, thanks for coming, everybody.